Shout out to Chargers Unleashed, Sebastian Joseph. They know the vibes. We outside. You're listening to the Chargers Unleashed podcast with your host, Dan Wolkenstein and Jake Hefner. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Eppner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, being brought to you by Bet Online, Charger Bolt Family, Rock Solid Sports Memorabilia, and Liquid Death. If this is your first time tuning in the show, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein, as I said to you last week, following the Chargers' victory over the Houston Texans, the past is a great place to visit, but you don't want to live there. And as we have finally vetted out all of our frustrations on the show yesterday, following the win, let's just, let's just call it the interesting win that took place with the Chargers and the Cleveland Browns. We now move on to Monday night in prime time. Chargers versus divisional rival Denver Broncos coming to town. And... You can't really say two ways about it. Dan and I like to do special guests for primetime episodes like this. And we've got a good one this week with a plethora of knowledge coming into this show. And Dan Wolkenstein, as he always does best, he does the best teasers when it comes to our special guests because I can't do them properly. So Dan Wolkenstein, once more, please take the reins. Yes. Friend of the show, the one and only Haley Elwood, Chargers team reporter, host of Playmakers, Final Drive co-host she will be joining us on Chargers Unleashed to talk about all things week five craziness we'll talk about kind of the current state of this Chargers team ways to improve Austin Eckler the offensive line the defense as well of course get into the primetime matchup next week versus the Broncos on Monday night Jake over or under how many times we're going to hear boos from Melvin Gordon in this upcoming Monday night game I'm going to go, I'll put the line at... Well, maybe the better way to do this, Dan, is how many carries would you expect Melvin Gordon to have? Okay, that's game? a better one. Okay, I'm going to go over under 22 and a half. So then the corresponding boos would be 22 and a half, in which case I'll go the over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll well, go speak- the over. Well, speaking of bets, our friends over at Bet Online, uh, let's talk about it for a little bit, Jake. They're giving out money. They're helping out folks with wages all over the place. Yeah, so what was we had head into NFL week 6, Bet Online remains your number one source for all of your betting needs this season. You'll find the latest odds, matchup info, player news and game trends, and as your continued source for all sports wagering info, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, live scores and giveaways all season long. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet on your favorite sports and events like MLB, MMA, tennis, boxing, and even golf. So head on over to betonline.ag and join and receive your 100% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. All right, so Jake, we're going to get into Haley Elwood conversation. This is a really, really fun one. So I don't know where folks are watching, listening, if you're at the gym, if you're in the car, if you're in bed watching, listening. Take a step back. Put your feet up. Take a drink. If there's something to drink that I would recommend taking a drink, our friends over at Liquid Thirst have some tall boys that can definitely help you with that thirst. It'll help you murder that thirst. Uh, Jake, let's go into the... Special guest episode with Haley Elwood. But first, we got to talk about Liquid Death. Yes. Well, you said Liquid Thirst first. I'm like, oh, that's a new one. I haven't heard of that one. So <laughs> I know where you were going with it, though. But yes, as Dan was was attempting to mention, our friends over at Liquid Death. Uh, if you guys have not gone out and gotten this new product, it's one of the uh, the newest sparkling uh, waters that are out there. It comes in three different flavors, of regular mango and lime. Again, if you want to find it, don't go in the alcohol section, even though it looks like it's a handful of tall boys. It's not. You could find it right next to the regular water or the energy drinks. It may it may look like tall boys, but don't let your eyes deceive you. Uh, as Dan mentioned, they are murdering thirst everywhere, whether you're going to your local Albertsons, your Ralphs, your 7-Elevens, your Kroger's, whatever it may be. Uh, fantastic new product. Go and check them out. Go on over to liquiddeath.com slash LAFB. Tell them Chargers Unleashed sent you and get yourself hydrated. Crack open a can of Liquid Death. Haley Elwood from Playmakers Chargers Team Reporter. Come up next on Chargers Unleashed. 
Yeah. Well, we are super excited today. Friend of the show, special guest, delighted to have Haley Elwood join us today on Chargers Unleashed to talk a little bit about these Chargers, talk about the crazy week five that was, get into kind of the current state of the team, as well as a week six preview going in up against primetime Denver Broncos, Russell Wilson. Haley, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I am good. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be back. It's been a minute, um, but doing well here on this Tuesday. I know we were just kind of talking offline and week six is both slow and fast at the same time, but here we are ready to roll. It's amazing. We're already coming up to one third of the way through this season, Jake. Like I know like we were talking about it all off season, like, oh my gosh, the season's taking forever to get started. Now it's like, well, fast forward, we're in the DeLorean. Slow down a little bit. <laughs> exactly. So look, we're going to get into a ton of things. We're going to get into obviously week five, week six, kind of go into some of the current state of this team, kind of go into some of the offensive line performances, Austin Eckler resurgence. But I think let's kind of just start off with the week that was. And look, that Cleveland game last year, I was there in person, was bananas. Uh, this was like a bunch of bananas. Uh, take us through like what your thoughts were of that game, kind of your takeaways, and just like the vibe of the team after that game. Yeah, I mean, I'll put it this way. Um, I didn't travel, but watching the broadcast at home, like everyone else, if you listen to Adam Archuleta in the third quarter, he said these two teams need to be on primetime next year if they meet again, because every single year now and back-to-back years and back-to-back week fives, crazy stuff happens like you mentioned it like just bananas bunches of bananas and, and things happen and so i think um you know I, I was in the locker room last week and i was asking guys on the defense about last year's game last year's game against the browns and no one wanted to talk about it they didn't want it they didn't like that it was a shootout they didn't like that it turned into that kind of game whereas we loved it because it was fun and it was wild and i think that was the funny part about the 2021 season where you had these teams in the first few weeks and you thought every single one of those games was going to be the shootout. It was going to be Kansas city. It was going to be Dallas. And then you get to Cleveland. You're like, Oh, this is the game. All right. <laughs> fine. Um, but you know, it was interesting. They didn't want to talk about it. They wanted to do better, which is commendable. They're like, that wasn't a good performance. This game turned into a crazy ground game on both sides for the most part. And I think, you know, obviously that last uh, little chunk there at the end got a little kind of nuts. <laughs> and you mentioned it, our blood pressures are down now. The, the team won, which is the, you know, the good takeaway out of all of this. Um, but there were some good and some bad, right? You, the good was you were able to run the ball effectively. Austin Eckler looked great. The run game looked great. They outscored their opponent in the second half, which hadn't happened. I believe they held Houston, or I'm sorry, Cleveland, yeah, scoreless in the fourth, which hadn't happened before. Um, some not so great, you know, stopping the run wasn't really there. And that's something that needs to get shored up. And then obviously, you know, there was the whole fourth down discourse that is still probably happening on Twitter as we speak. But, you know, I think in in you can look at it. I think you can have the same view in two different ways. You cannot be surprised that Brandon Staley went for it because it's who he is. I always like to say if he was on an episode of Sesame Street, he would be sponsored by the letter C because of competition and conviction. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, yes. he is so in, you know, serious and, and convicted about his ways of going about things. But I think you could be surprised at the circumstance that arose with it. And the surrounding circumstance. And I know that the team went for it fourth and two from their own 45 a week prior against the Texans. But I said this on our final drive podcast, the circumstances were different. Houston needed three to tie and seven to win. The Browns needed three to win. And that was the difference there. And so I think you can look at it both and not be surprised and also be surprised at the same time. But at the end of the day, the Chargers got out of there with a win, and that's what's most important. And, and I got to ask you, just you personally, I, I can speak for myself, and I immediately thought, okay, fourth and two, they're going to probably try to drum off sides and then punt it. If it was you, would you <laughs> would you have been like, I'm not handling that, I'm just going to punt it? Would you have like divvied off those responsibilities to somebody else? Like, what would you have done? Like, I was shocked, and I'm a, and I've seen this Chargers team in Brandon Staley. How did you yeah. feel about it? I mean. Dan, that is way above my pay grade here. I am not an NFL head coach. True professional. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I think I think you can again kind of just look at it both ways. You can look at the trust that Staley has in his team, both offensively and defensively. You look at the fact that hey, we want to keep the ball in our offense's hands. Okay, it doesn't work out. Defense go win the game for us, and that's essentially what he said at the end of the game. Now, granted, Cleveland missed a kick, you know, and and that kicker had made a fifty. What was it, fifty eight yarder in week one? So, in that regard, it worked out. But I think. Again, it's that conviction, man. He just cares so freaking much about the guys on this team and really has faith in them. And and at the end of the day, I think it says a lot. And and Austin Eckler talked about this and Sebastian talked about this on Monday that it says a lot that your coach has that belief in you, regardless on whatever side of the ball that you're on, that he really truly does believe in you as the players to go out and get the job done. Now, Haley, for a long time, Chargers fan base has had to deal with adversity for a lot of different reasons, even going back to the Marty Schottenheimer days. We've gone through these ups and these downs before for a multitude of different reasons. This year, adversity decided to hit this team very, very early on. In week one, you lose Keenan Allen for an extended period of time. In week two, Justin Herbert goes down with fractured rib cartilage. Week three, you lose Rashawn Slater, Joey Bosa, both premier players at their position. You have some good things that come about with the rise of Jamari Sawyer coming into the left tackle position, as you mentioned, the resurgence of the run game in these last couple of weeks. Give us kind of just with everything that's been going on as we stand today going into week six, what would you say is like the current state of the team from both a health standpoint, mentality standpoint, maybe just even a coaching standpoint as it stands right now? I think there's a real resilience that you're kind of seeing right now. And you mentioned that this adversity happened early. And I forget who it was. I forget if it was Derwin. I forget if it was Austin. But someone mentioned it a couple weeks ago saying maybe it's good that this adversity hit early. Maybe it's good that it happened so early in the season when everyone's still kind of trying to figure themselves out. Like, who are we as a team on both sides of the ball, whatever it is, versus maybe in the middle of the season when you're kind of on a roll and you're cruising and then, oh, Justin's down. Oh, Joey's down. And you have to sort of figure things out then. Maybe it's good that it happened early. Two weeks ago, this team was one and two. And I said this on our final drive podcast that that was uncharted territory for the Brandon Staley era of Chargers football. They had not been under 500 before. They had not been in a situation where they needed to pull themselves out of it. They treaded 500 and maybe above it a couple times last year, but they had never been below. And seeing how they were going to respond was going to be key. And we looked ahead, as we always do, and said, okay, you have road games against Houston, you have road games against Cleveland, and then you come home to face the Broncos and the Seahawks before you're by. If you can win those two games on the road, you're above 500. And granted, Houston scares a lot of people because of what happened last year. For good reason. And good for good reason. And Cleveland is who they are, but they did it. They were able to figure out a way, find a way to win. It necessarily wasn't very pretty. It necessarily might have given people heart attacks or blood pressure issues at the end of last week, like you mentioned it, but they found a way. And so I think that's what you want to see at this point in the season. You want to see your team, when times get tough, handle that adversity, be resilient, and find a way because it's a long season. Austin said it yesterday. We're glad the season's not five weeks, you know, and here we are in week six and the team is three and two in an AFC that is sort of wild and crazy and not just the AFC West, just the AFC in general. I mean, the Jets are three and two right now. Who would have known that um, coming in? But there's so much football left to be played. But the fact, like you mentioned that, that you've gotten production from some young guys who have had to step up, it's huge and bigger than that. You found a way to get back above 500 and found a way to win when times got really tough. Yeah, and going 2-0 and is not easy in the NFL on the road, regardless of who your opponents are any yeah. given Sunday. And for them to be able to squeak out those victories, regardless of how it happened, like you'll take it. No one's going to look back on this and be like, oh my gosh, could you believe how that happened? It's a win or a loss in the loss column or win column. And you got it. Um, one of the things, one of the biggest reasons why we've seen a lot of resurgence, we're talking to Haley Elwood, team reporter for the Los Angeles Chargers, is the running game is starting to come back. You see Austin Eckler, he got three touchdowns two weeks ago, balled out last year, last week. I think he had the most yards after, yards before contact in his career this past week. A lot of reasons for that. Obviously, mm -hmm. the offensive line's doing well, but like, what do you make of kind of the biggest differences from weeks, I guess, one through three to four and five? for Austin Eckler or just this ground game in general? I think it all comes together between 
Austin between maybe Joshua Kelly in a, a sense to the running backs and the offensive line together cohesively. And we had heard Joe Lombardi week after week over the last couple of weeks, just talk about, we need to get it going and it's coming down to execution. And it's not one guy. It's all these guys working together. And Austin said yesterday, it was frustrating and Part of that was just they weren't able to find a rhythm. And I think also when you look at the Jacksonville game, they then got so far behind that then they just had to start throwing the ball and you abandon the run completely. But earlier in the season, he said, we just weren't able to find a rhythm. He's like, we're practicing great. Everything's going great in practice, but it just wasn't clicking when it came together in a game. But now you're seeing it click. You're seeing it come together. But I think you're right, though. It, it's everyone doing their jobs together at the same time and doing it well. And I think part of that is they face some attrition, obviously, on the offensive line. They face some game situations where they've had to sort of, again, rise above it and find a way. But you're now seeing it. And I said this, too, on, on our Monday podcast these groups didn't play together in the preseason. And I know it's weird to still bring that up here in week six, but there has to be some truth to just finding your rhythm. Like when you hear Austin use a word like that, it's playing together. And that's something Brandon Staley said, that the more we play together in every facet of this game, the better that we'll be. Now, you, you said the, the word rhythm, and I kind of find that interesting because Jake and I were talking about this on a few episodes where like, why are they not able to find the rhythm? Like, what was the reason for that? And is that because... They weren't able to sustain drives. Was that because of you know drops at key points or missed blocks? Like, do you think there's any constant theme for why they weren't able to establish rhythm? I'm not sure. I mean, again, like kind of just listening to what Austin was saying yesterday, it just was almost like game situations were just different than what was happening in practice, obviously. And I think Sebastian said it on the flip side when it comes to defending the run too. It's it's like little things that we practice well, but then you get in the game and, oh, there might be a miscommunication that happens. And that was something that Bash said, again, flipping it to the, to the run defense. But I think it's just, again, it's kind of just maybe trying to figure things out. One thing interesting that Austin said yesterday was, a lot of the attrition that they faced on the offensive line did dictate some of the moves that they had to make and adjustments that they had to make. So he mentioned it. Instead of running outside, they ran through the A gaps and the B gaps really well against Cleveland. So you're working that interior. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes down to just maybe trusting, you know, Staley said Filer played his best game of the year on Sunday against, against Cleveland. So finding those ways, finding those adjustments, making those adjustments – I think is something that it's good to see this progress now. You've had two pretty good weeks of it. Can it keep going? Can it keep being sustained that way as they get through the season? Well, let's transition to that, Haley, because obviously the offensive line has been a key component to this run game's resurgence, obviously has been doing a good job of keeping Justin Herbert up on his feet. And when you have three young players and a six-round rookie in Jamari Sawyer coming in for Rashawn Slater, the way that Zion Johnson has performed in his rookie season thus far, Unreal. The, the work that Trey Pipkins has put in in, in the offseason definitely paying off for him. With that combination with Corey Lindsley and Matt Fireler and what this message of this offensive line and how they've performed thus far, talk about just them as, as a unit. And as you had said, it's it's been a little bit of a learning curve with some of these new bodies around. But this, this unit has been one of the bright spots of this team consistently through five weeks. Um, yeah, just, just talk about this unit for a little bit. I think a bright spot when we were all terrified when Slater went it down was 100%. Was, it was going to look like because he that was such a tremendous loss. Um, you touched on some guys, and, and I'll kind of piggyback off of them. First off, with Zion, you know, I remember Tom Telesco after they drafted being like, whoa, 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 like whatever happened with Rashawn Slater, you know, we can't hold that as like the benchmark because he just accomplished things that were unbelievable to an extent. That kid has held his own, and it has been incredible to see him out there. And he and Trey really have something working quite nicely on that side. When it comes to Filer, you know, you mentioned, obviously, and, and Staley mentioned he played his best game. Salier, I mean, what can you say? And especially the talent that he went up against with Miles Garrett, who, you know, probably isn't 100%, but played a lot and and played a lot. Of, and he held his own, and to not allow a sack, I mean, again, it – it's just kind of impressive. And, and I remember we, we talked about this too. He was a six round pick out of Georgia, but the competition that he faced was incredible. And so you look at, okay, maybe it's not a case of where you're drafted, but just what you make of the opportunity when you get it in the NFL. When it comes to Trey, this is such an incredible story. And I actually wrote a note because I wanted to talk about it because Joe Lombardi mentioned something last week about him and his presser 
He said, we think we had an opinion on him last year that wasn't fair. And when I heard that, it just kind of like made me pause for a second because he said they really had to go back and check the tape and they realized when he played tackle, he looked good. And they really sort of had to stop and reevaluate and made the decision to give him every single opportunity to earn that starting right tackle job. The guy got a game ball. I mean, the whole offensive line got a game ball this week. But, you know, they made the joke like Trey, like take it and, and he picked it up <laughs> on Sunday. And I just think it's just one of those stories that's truly incredible. And when you look at where he was drafted and I, I talked to him over the summer in camp and he was a project from the beginning. But, you know, as a third round pick, you have high expectations. And he had mentioned he faced a lot of adversity just on his own. He had not had the same. He's never had the same offensive line coach his entire career in the NFL. Every year wow. it's been someone who's been different. And so when you look at that and you look at a young player from a school like Sioux Falls that isn't going up against the talent that someone like Jamari Salyer is going up against at Georgia, it's hard to kind of find his way. And he said he really sort of had to buckle down and really just get back to basics. And it was hard for him because he mentioned, you know, I was looking at Brian Belager. I was looking at all these other guys, Russell Okun at some point and saying, you know, how can I emulate them? What's their style? And then you have all these different offensive line coaches coming in and their philosophy kind of changes. And again, it happens this year. You go from Frank Smith to Brendan Nugent. But he said with Nugent and Smith, there's su there is a similarity there. And it feels even though the, the person is different, it has felt sort of more consistent. But I just thought that that comment that Joe Lombardi made, just saying that we had an opinion on him that wasn't necessarily fair, was so poignant to me because it just showed that they went back, they looked at the tape, they checked the tape, they evaluated and said, hey, let's give this guy a shot. And look at what he's done. He goes out in that game and everyone's freaking out. And a couple of <laughs> years ago... You know, I'm not sure we would have had that that same sort of reaction, but that's just sort of the evolution of life in the NFL. And some guys, it just might take a little longer to progress, especially given the circumstances of where he came from previously. But I think when you look at everything as a whole and you've seen also just the impact that Corey Lindsley has made as well as just, you know, incredible and and he's cracked up and everything you know i think that they wanted him to be he's been but just looking at trey it's just been really really nice and again he on the and zion on that right side they're building something really special on that side and as good as the left side has been if you can get that right side as good you're in great shape it, it is interesting and i think it's it's got to be tough or it had to have been tough for for trey because there was so much noise outside yeah. and you know fans whether it's opposing teammates or opposing teams going up against him and you know he he had gotten beat quite a bit and you know it's a learning curve for sure and i think it's got to be so bittersweet for him now like and you saw it like i was getting chills watching that uh post game speech from staley and seeing him get that the huge smile on his face and jamar sawyer in the background i was just like yeah talk about a surreal like full circle moment for him and to shut everybody up if we're being blunt i think it's been it's been a really big off season for him. And now seeing the fruition come from that, I think it's been, you're right. When I'm, it's just it's funny when he goes out last week, everyone's <laughs> freaking out and years past, they would have been a completely 180 on that. So yeah. props to him. I mean, he, he deserves it. He's put a work, a ton of work in and you're seeing the results of it. Um, transition to the other side. You know, I think everyone was excited about this Brandon Staley, guru defense and everyone's excited about like with the possibility of that and then you you know first year he didn't really have the guys that he needed then he goes out and gets jc jackson he gets you know the khalil max he gets sebastian joseph day he's get kyle Vendor, like you know all of the guys and you're it's kind of felt a little up and down i know joey bosa going out's been kind of a big deal you know against houston the team defense looked pretty good but like it's kind of been a little up and down defense has given up a lot of like big runs 40 plus or more i think in four straight weeks now like, how would you assess just the overall defense? Like, is it what you expected? Are there things are still tweaking? Like, what's been kind of the reasoning for that up and down feel? I'm going to quote Brandon Staley. It's a work in progress. That's what he said yesterday when he was asked about the defense. He literally said it is a work in progress. And I think you look at it right. 
the impact of losing Joey Bosa is huge. And all off season long, it's Bosa Mac, Bosa Mac, you know, Chandler Jones, Max Crosby, uh, the whole AFC West edge rusher conversation. And you, when you lose 50% of that, it's tough because it gives teams automatic, you know, the automatic reign to just double team Khalil Mack, whatever it is, just to essentially take him out of the game because you don't have to pick your poison, right? You just know you have to pretty much deal with one. So losing Joey is huge. The rest of the defense, though, is still – they're healthy pretty much, and, and they're all still there and, and working, but there has been some up and down. You nailed it. Staley mentioned, you know, there are certain games where they felt – he felt they've played excellent. Other games, other quarters in games, he just said has not been good enough. I mean, when you look at the stats, not statistically doing the best, but it's still early in the season. And again, now I said this on the final drive, and I, I'm just – I feel like I'm repeating myself, but – as good as it is to see the run game moving forward at this point in the season, that's what you want the run defense to be as well. You want to see that type of improvement. You know, here we are week five, week six. Um, you're going to face some great running backs throughout the rest of the season. I mean, hello, Derrick Henry in December, whenever that game is. is. But again, it goes back to, I think, just what Staley has said. The more we play together, the better that we'll be. Again, not a lot of preseason time that this group saw playing together. JC Jackson, you know, missed a couple games, has been back in there. But when it comes to it, I think, again, it's just going to take some time. And the crazy thing, though, is when we're in training camp, right, the defense always seems so far ahead of the offense. Like you're out at practice and you just see like them flying around and how crazy it is. But then you get into game situations and it's different. And so I just think it's going to take some time. But Brandon Steely was very candid about it. And he's not sitting here gloating about it. He said, you know, we're a work in progress and we got things to tune up. And um, but when it comes down to it, again, it's just getting that cohesion together and being in game situations and trying to figure it out. I think one of the things I think Chargers fans have kind of gotten a little, you know, obviously when Justin Herbert goes down for a bit with a rib injury, like I think people are freaking out. Is he going to be okay? Is it going to be good enough? That first week back was kind of rocky, but he he looked fine. And the coaching staff kind of alluded to the fact they were kind of a little um, safe at the beginning of that. They kind of been a little bit aggressive moving forward. looks like it has been much more yeah. normal. Justin Herbert. Um, what's your kind of assessment of just him, how he's feeling, like the impact his injuries had on these games? Like, is there anything the team seems to be doing like differently now? Or are there things that you might see us do more moving forward as the year progresses? I think when you look at that Cleveland game, the quick passing game was so effective and just getting the ball out so quickly was something that he did phenomenally well and the team did really well because you obviously mitigate the pressure that's coming from the guys off the edge. Um, which is huge because you don't want to end up on the ground from either Miles Garrett or Jadavian Clowney. Um, but just being able to get it off, I think, quick was was really, really big. Brandon Staley, something that um, a couple guys had told me, one of the things that he does is, and it sounds dumb to say because it's like, yeah, duh, you should do this as a head coach in the NFL, but really tailors the game plan to like that specific opponent. And so when you talk about Cleveland and you think, oh, these two edge rushers are probably coming back and these are two of probably some of the best talent that they've seen all season up until this point with a quarterback that still is dealing with something. Um, you got to have a game plan for that. And so as much as your protection game and schemes have held up, getting the ball out quicker, I think is something that you saw them do and do really well against Cleveland. And maybe something that that, that they, that that is something that they incorporate moving forward. Joe Lombardi talked about, you know, that Jags game saying, I think, we were all a little apprehensive as to what it was going to be, what Herbert was going to be like, the type of game that was called. And I think as, again, these weeks have gone on and he's been out there and certainly looked more comfortable. I'm not going to speak for him. I, I don't know. I assume he's probably still dealing with stuff. It doesn't really seem like what you hear, that that's an injury that just goes away. Um, but I think, again, they're sort of tailoring the game plan a little bit to suit him to suit some of the guys around him and you saw it be effective last week against cleveland now, Haley, i know we're six days away so i know we're a little bit early taking a preview into the monday night matchup between the chargers and the broncos but kind of picking up piggybacking off of the things that you have said as far as areas of improvement overall what what would we expect going up against this matchup obviously divisional games are pertinent when it comes especially to making the playoffs especially in the afc they're always but wild 
taking us oh. into the future a little bit, what would you expect to see from this matchup? Maybe again, where the Chargers would like to improve. Um, this is a very good defensive team that the Chargers are going up against. So what, what does your view look like as it stands right now? Yeah, so here's the thing with the AFC West, right? We're all watching this Monday night football game between the Raiders and the Chiefs. And those of us who live in the AFC West are going, just another primetime game between two AFC West teams because it's always weird, always gets kind of funky. Um, the Broncos are an interesting team. Um, areas of improvement, I think obviously Chargers rush defense, we'll get to Melvin Gordon in a second, getting pressure on the quarterback, not something they did particularly great against Cleveland, and I think that needs to be better. And then just continuing the rushing offense. Now, Denver, I don't know what to make of this team, you guys. <laughs> like, offensively, I'll say this, I don't know what to make of them. Denver as a whole has been one of these interesting teams with the Chargers where they tend to split. Like really over the last couple of years, you tend to split games and you're one and one against them at the end of the year. This is an entirely new team defensively freaking awesome. I was looking at some of their stats today and I was actually shocked at how in the majority of defensive categories, they rank in the top 10. They're third in total defense. I have them right here. First in red zone defense. And that's something that I think the Chargers should definitely take note of because there were a couple field, you know, short field goals that the sweet kicker made last week, but you would want those to, you know, rather be touchdowns than field goals at that point. They're allowing a fourth best 16 points per game. So they are stingy. You saw it against the Colts, but that whole game was just sort of a cluster in general. But when you really parse their defense back, they're good. Bradley Chubb has five and a half sacks. Baron Browning, I think I read he was basically an outside linebacker last game ended up with one and a half sacks, six quarterback hits, two tackles for loss. I mean, they are flying around. Justin Simmons could be back for this game. So defensively, I look at this team and go, you cannot count them out. Offensively, I have no clue what to make of the Broncos. And I think one of the crazy things is when I talk about the Chargers and Broncos sort of splitting over the last couple of years, you had really subpar quarterback play. I mean, you never really had to worry about Drew Locke, but then sometimes he would beat you. Here you have mm. Russell Wilson, who's a former Super Bowl winning quarterback who isn't really looking like it right now. But something just tells me, and, and Austin said this too, you cannot count this team out. And you just, I hate to make this joke, but you know, after the Thursday night game, people are going, I never want to see the Broncos on primetime again. They show our bump in the game last night and Twitter's like, gosh, really guys? Like, you know, we have to see the Broncos again. I don't think they want to be in the same situation that they were in 10, 11 days ago once that game rolls around. And so I think they're going to give you their best effort. I think Melvin Gordon is going to come in fired up. <laughs> I saw a report. Um, James Palmer from NFL Network had mentioned this. Losing Javante Williams is huge for them, obviously. But when he talked about Melvin, he said these are the situations where Melvin Gordon thrives. He likes to be the number one. We talk about a rhythm, and he goes, he's a rhythm back. He likes to be that guy. And you saw it with the Chargers. Once Austin Eckler sort of started coming into his own, things with Melvin got a little funky. But when Melvin is that guy from the get-go, he can be a serious bell cow back in the NFL and he's had success that way. So I just think it is going to be such an interesting game. It's probably going to get weird because it always <laughs> does. It's Monday night football. It's an AFC West game. ESPN's got two straight weeks of, of AFC West uh, primetime play here. So Monday's game was great, you know, from an excitement sort of craziness standpoint. I hope next Monday's is just as good. But I do think the Broncos are a team you just can't count them out. I just think it's just hard to think that they're going to lay down and die at this point in the season, right? It's, and and they, they seem to be like, and we talked about this when the Chargers after the Jaguars game. Like, if they're not pissed off after that game and the last few performances yeah. that they've had, like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, <laughs> you would think that they would come out guns blazing. I don't know. Um, Haley Elwood, always a pleasure. You crushed it. I mean, we went through so many things today, and you – are perfect, like always. Uh, you can see her on Playmakers. She does final drive. She's a sideline reporter for the Chargers. Haley, anything else you're working on these days on the side that you want us to help you guys promote? 
Um, we're getting Mina Kimes this week on Playmakers. Nice. We're really excited about that. Have not. Um, I met her briefly at Justin Herbert's golf tournament uh, a year ago. So not this past year, but the summer prior. Um, haven't had a chance, honestly, to like sit down and, and talk to her about Chargers football. So really excited. That usually it comes out on Wednesdays. It's going to come out on Friday this week just because of scheduling and everything with Monday Night Football. So, um, hey, if anyone's got questions for Mina Kimes, send them in the comments, put them down here. I will check this. Um, cause I'm just, I'd love to get her take on everything going on with the chargers. And also she's a, you know, Seahawks fan. So she knows Russell Wilson really, really well, and may be able to shed some light on what the heck is going on there right now in Denver. Another one of the most, the smartest analysts in the game right now. I mean, the kind of great. So I can't wait to watch that one. I'm definitely gonna be tuning yeah. in. Uh, yeah. Haley Elwood, you can find her on Twitter at Haley Elwood. Haley, thank you so much for tuning in and helping us out on this one. We'll talk to you soon. Friend of the show. You're welcome anytime. All right. Thanks, guys, for having me. We'll definitely do this again. Thanks, Thanks. Haley.